Vikes now. I am Dustin Baker. We are here to talk about the one in four Vikings, or more realistically, what is around the bend for 2024 and beyond. Why are we already looking at 2024 on October 10th, one day before this guy's 40th birthday? Well, the uh, you woke up to the news that the Vikings will put Justin Jefferson, presumably, on the shelf uh, for four weeks, four games. That would be at Soldier Field against the Unstoppable 49ers the week after, at Lambeau Field the week after that, and then I think on the road against the Falcons. And that is not a good prognosis for a team that I think wants to fix everything on the fly and make a playoff push and challenge the Lions. It's probably not happening now that Justin Jefferson is gone. Yes, the Vikings could pull off some their version of their miracle and win four straight, and everybody's happy Jefferson returns on... Was it the week 11 game? But let's face it, we're, we're, that's probably not going to happen. And all of this talk from me uh, and all of the hope from you that, you know, if they just fix this fumble problem and stop these turnovers, they can really get good. That still probably is true. But now at 1-4 and four and without Justin Jefferson, even if they stop turnovers altogether, I don't know that they would be able to play flawless football long enough to have it make a difference. Because even if they play a perfect game without turnovers, are they really going to beat the 49ers who just bulldoze the Cowboys 42 to 10? Maybe, but I don't think so. So realistically, where we are at is that this team is angling. Uh, at least the vibe is angling for change in 2024. We're already two years into a competitive rebuild. Kirk Cousins is the last hangover to the competitive part of the competitive rebuild, and boom, you're at one and four. So I want to t explain to you guys and gals why the Caleb Williams sweepstakes is more realistic than ever. And it really wasn't even realistic until, in my opinion, this morning, because Justin Jefferson being out indefinitely four games is what, what they will say. But I'm telling you right now, if the Vikings are one and seven or two and or yeah, what would it be? Two and six, two and seven, or something by that like that. By the time Jefferson gets back, there's no reason to bring him back if the hamstring is grim enough for him to hit hit our IR in the first place. Uh, because why? Why? What would be the point if you're two and seven and Jefferson has a bad hamstring? You might as well get him ready for next year. Give him a fat contract and go forth. Um, but there are a lot of things aligning at the moment for this Caleb Williams sweepstakes. And let me get a disclaimer out. This is not a show that says, yeah, the Vikings need to tank and trade everybody and go 1-16 in to get the draft pick for Caleb Williams. No, I don't, think, I don't think, A, they will do that, and B, I don't think they're that bad that that's going to happen. Um, and one problem to getting the Caleb Williams pick is that you probably have to go through the Chicago Bears to get it. So you'll want them to believe that Justin Fields is indeed their quarterback of the future so that they're more willing to trade the, the pick that the Vikings could, in theory, get Caleb Williams. But let's go through all of these markers to illuminate why the Caleb Williams sweepstakes that was once a, a joke or you know a dedicated Twitter account for some, why it's real now. The most obvious part right now is that the Vikings are 1-4. Most of us... This guy especially, a lot of my peers didn't think that they would be one and four, maybe two and three, winning, uh, winning that Buccaneers game and then having the rest of the season unfold. But the fact of the matter is they're one and four right now. If the draft was held tonight, the Vikings would pick fourth overall, which is likely prime real estate for Drake May and is a luscious draft capital to trade up to go get to whichever guy that they want, whether it's Williams or May. So the Vikings really don't have to do anything different right now. It's continue at the same pace of one and four because bada bang, that's going to get you a real high draft pick in April and probably enough to get Kayla Williams or if Drake May is more of your uh, your guy, so be it. But they're already in the crater, the one in four crater, and it it doesn't feel like they're on the cusp of. Oh, they were so close. I mean, yeah, the Chiefs game was competitive, but they keep doing the same shit every week. The first first quarter is undone by a fumble or an interception against the Panthers, and they're off to the races trying to play catch up. Well, we can fix that sin and do a bunch of stuff. 
They never do it. They, they do just enough to make the game competitive after the first turnover of the game. It is the same movie every week. Every single Vikings game this season has featured a turnover on offense in the first quarter. And then th that's what they do for the, the, the next 60 minutes of NFL time and three hours of your, your lifetime. They're hoping that things break in their favor and that they can perhaps, you know, pull off the the, uh, the little upset after their shenanigans in the first quarter, and it's just not working. So they already have the one and four start. They've hopped out to a bad win loss record that suggests that they are in the the very visible Caleb Williams. They don't even have to do anything. Just keep doing what you're doing. Even with Jefferson there, you were one and four. Now the the the, the biggest. A marker for the Caleb Williams sweepstakes suddenly on October 10th becoming really, really real is that Jeff, Justin Jefferson hits IR. Now, if the imagine, imagine our emotions if the Vikings were four and one and this happened. Oh, it would be dreadful uh, that they're going to lose Jefferson if they somehow were four and one. Uh, but there's a little bittersweet solace in knowing whether well, one and four. What else can go wrong? Oh, the best player, the NFL. Network's top 100, second best player in the league, hits the shelf for four weeks. So it's a little uh, muted, the, the anguish of losing Jefferson, because they're not very good in the first place. But now, with Jefferson, I don't know how severe the hamstring in, in, uh, injury is. I don't know that any guys or gals like me know that yet. I'm, I think it'll probably come out soon if it, you know, it must be somewhat bad if he's going to be on the shelf for four games. This is like the, the god, the Norse god saying, all right, you are one and four. We're subtracting your best player for the next four games, and we may not even see him after that. It's really eerie how the Caleb Williams stuff or Drake May stuff is coming together. A one and four start, the best player goes on the shelf. It screams like everything is coming together for the Vikings to at least get a high round draft pick to get a quarterback uh, that they like. Whether or not it'll be high enough for Williams, we shall see. Prime territory for May. If they like somebody like Bo Nix or Shadur Sanders or Michael Penix, we shall see. <clears throat> But the other, like, you know, if you're still in the camp, well, they can turn it around. Jefferson will be back in four weeks, baby. They employ a quarterback on an expiring contract. I think the Vikings hedged the bet and did not give Kirk Cousins an extension this past offseason because they wanted to see if some stuff like this would happen. If they, they formulated this roster, they brought in Brian Flores, you look up as of October 10th and they're one and four, they didn't want to be connected to Cousins, in my opinion, after 2023 if things broke bad. <clears throat> right now, the Vikings are breaking bad. That's all there is to it. The Jefferson an IR trip is just an insult to injury or more injuries uh, to insult, pun intended. Um, if there was ever a way that Kirk Cousins this season was going to depart and hit free agency in 2024, starting one and four with the team's best player hitting IR would be the formula to do it. So I do think that wholesale change is coming at the quarterback position. Now, if Cousins was, if, if they had extended them this offseason through the end of 2025, for the most part, all of this Caleb Williams stuff would be moot, but they strategically did not. And now they're one in four. Their quarterback is scheduled to hit free agency in five months, and their best player is injured. It's <laughs> when you start putting all these things, stringing them together, it's like flashing lights on a billboard that like, wow. This season is going to be one that goes on the ash heap of Vikings history, and it's going to be a you know springboard to getting the next guy after Kirk. Um, so the next four games, I already uh, enumerated them out of the gate. The Bears, 49ers, Packers, and then Falcons. They should be able to beat the Bears. I don't know which version of the Bears will show up, if it's the high-flying team that just spanked the Commanders or if it's the nauseating one from the first three weeks. Uh, they should be able, per talent, to beat the Bears, but I don't really think they're going to. Uh, Soldier Field, they've been on a nice little winning streak at Soldier Field. I think they've won three straight there. I think it's time to pay the Piper. Win or loss, no matter what happens on Sunday at noon, then you have the 49ers coming to U.S. Bank Stadium who are probably going to give the Vikings their fourth home loss of the year or fifth consecutive since they lost the Giants in the postseason. Well, how does that, let's just say they beat the Bears, how does that 2-5 and five team, what's their next assignment? Oh, you get to go to Lambeau Field, uh, where I think they are 7-15-2 since 2000. The Vikings don't usually play well at Lambeau Field. When it does, it feels like, whoa, wow, we did something really special. We won a game at Lambeau Field. 
And it really, I don't know, I don't know if it'll matter that Aaron Rodgers doesn't work there. I'm going to guess that that building is still hazy with bad voodoo for Minnesota, but we shall see. And then the Falcons, uh, I'm not sure if they're good or not. They don't even use their best players uh, besides Bijan Robinson. They don't really throw it to Kyle Pitts. They don't really throw it to Drake London when they do. It's like cause for celebration. So I don't know how to size up the Falcons. That's too far away. <clears throat> we'll get there when we get there. Uh, but the, the, the docket, historically bad places for the Vikings. Soldier Field, Lambeau Field, it's sandwiched in between is the best team in football. All while Justin Jefferson isn't playing, there is a very viable pathway to that time, what would it be, a 2-7 and seven record? 1-8, and eight, something like that. It doesn't seem far-fetched that the Vikings will only win one of these next three or four games. And then, right on that draft board, or at least the mock draft board, or tankathon.com, the Vikings are still going to live at 1, 2, 3, or 4. And how, what do you do when you have that draft capital? You go get Drake May or Caleb Williams. And then the other caveat, this one is really interesting, uh, just, just, a, just a total subplot, a by the way, is that Nick Mullins is hurt. And it sounds like the Vikings are contemplating putting him on IR because he hurt his back doing something. It wasn't playing on the regular season field. And then if, like, let's say Cousins got hurt or Cousins is traded or he's benched or something like that, then if Nick Mullins isn't even available, <clears throat> that means you're turning to Jaron Hall to see what you have in him. And I'm going to guess that's not much. I mean, maybe he blossoms into something two or three years from now, like, you know, late rounders sometimes do. But I don't think anybody watching this show or who watches the Vikings football in general would see, oh, they're starting Jaron Hall this week. That'll probably be a dub. No, you would think, oh, boy, this, is, this guy's going to look raw. This is probably going to be a loss, especially when you're playing at Soldier Field, at Lambeau Field, and in between the 49ers. And the, the Mullins thing is especially interesting. Um, let's say the Kirk Cousins trade rumors that became ever-present the moment that I think the Vikings lost the first game to the Buccaneers and Aaron Rodgers was hurt. Everybody said, oh, he's going to go to play for the Jets. I don't think the Jets are going to trade for Kirk Cousins because why would you sink more high-round draft capital into an old quarterback? But I could see somebody like the Patriots making the phone call. The Falcons are intriguing if they think that they can be a playoff team. Or even uh, Kyle uh, Jodry from Purple PTSD told me this morning he thinks it could be the Steelers. Uh, so if the Cousins, let's say the tr trade rumor mill is correct, Kwesi Dafaminsa evaluates, well, yeah, we are 1-4. We just lost our best player. And we get to the trade deadline, and they're 1-7. And, and they do send Cousins somewhere. Well, Nick Mullins may not be available. And then you're looking at fully inserting Jaron Hall indefinitely into the Vikings lineup. And I think that would be considered a tank. After after Kwesi Dafa Mensa said that you know he finds it unconscionable, he said that the NFL Combine, I think that you would have a full-scale tank job if Jaron Hall was the quarterback. Maybe not intentionally, uh, because you thought it was better to get draft pick for Cousins and then Mullins happened to get hurt and Hall is your only recourse, unless you want to go sign Carson Wentz or Nick Foles or Colt McCoy or whatever the flavor of the week free agency would float your boat. There are guys available. But the interesting part of the Mullins injury is, hypothetically, if the Vikings did realize that we're not going anywhere, so we're going to trade Kirk Cousins, hopefully for a first, uh, you know, at the bottom floor, a second, then you wouldn't have Mullins available because his back hurts and he's on IR, and you would be going with both feet in on Jaron Hall, a QB2 of Tanner Morgan, and then whoever you decided as a free agent. And that would almost certainly, unless Jaron Hall's this unforeseen baller, that would almost certainly net three and fourteen, four and thirteen record again. Prime real estate for Caleb Williams or if Drake May is your guy. So the Justin Jefferson injury this morning changed everything. There was always a last big gasp or a desperation hope that all right, they're going to beat the Bears, and then they're somehow going to beat the 49ers. The Packers don't have Aaron Rodgers. The Falcons ain't shit. They're going to rattle off four wins because Justin Jefferson, Kirk Cousins have that connection. But now Justin Jefferson, gone for four games. And the Vikings haven't been winning games as is. So they're faced with trying to right the ship without their best player. A trade deadline that is looming in 21 days, three weeks from today. And a team that has very 
publicly announced that it's already rebuilding, but it's a, a competitive rebuild. They could lean more into the rebuilding part of the competitive rebuild because of the hand they've been dealt with wins and losses and then Justin Jefferson's injury. So it started off, like I said, at the top of the show where folks just create Twitter accounts dedicated to the Caleb Williams in a Vikings uniform and we're going to do the thing. Um, but now it's, it's, it's turning somewhat real. The likelihood of the Vikings organically getting the first overall pick for Williams is probably low. The Bears own their own pick, and they're not very good, and they own the Panthers pick, and they're for damn sure not very good. So yes, the Vikings would have to get very creative in getting to Caleb Williams, and it would involve the Bears remaining committed to Justin Fields and willing to trade with the Vikings, which would be a, a colossal package. Um, but if your starting point from the Vikings piggy bank is, well, we got the fourth overall pick, Mr. Poles. What else would you want? That is a good bargaining chip. Whereas if the Vikings had turned this season around and ended up going seven and 10 or eight and nine, then you're in the middle of the pack and that draft pick that you'd be trading to the Bears or whoever has the first pick is less tantalizing. But always remember that on October 10th, you woke up to the news that Justin Jefferson is certifiably heading to IR. We don't know when he's coming back. The Vikings are 1-4. and four. Their quarterback is not committed to the team beyond 2023 financially. I know he wants to come back, but I don't think the Vikings are going to have him back. A somewhat daunting schedule around the bend with Lambeau Field, Soldier Field, Lambeau Field, the 49ers. And then, by the way, the QB2 is also hurt. It is everything is coagulating at this moment to suggest if there was ever a way for the Vikings to embark on the Caleb Williams sweepstakes, the time is now. Bad shit has encountered, has, it, has straight up happened. And so now the, the markers are there. If they want it, they can attempt to go get it. All right, we'll be back. I'm going to ask Josh Fry what he wants to talk about tomorrow. Usually we, we dissect, like, how are they going to beat the Bears? Or what the hell happened with the Chiefs? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if those are relevant during Justin Jefferson's injury week, but we will nevertheless be back tomorrow to talk about these Vikings. Skull, baby.